Hello, everybody. This week we have Junaid Gurchan Akchara from the University of Manitoba, who is going to be speaking to us about TDA on networks, applications, and scalability issues. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope you can hear me well. Uh, okay, I see the hand sign from El Sanan that everything is all right. Uh, I have been uh, at University of Manitoba since 2019 as an assistant professor of computer science and statistics. And uh, since 2016, we have been, during my postdoc, we have been working on topological data analysis on networks. So in this presentation, I will be showing our work in applying TDA to networks and what kind of problems we encounter. Uh, in my talk, I will have some basic information about TDA which you will very well know because this is the topology group. But uh, Al Haran told me that this will be shared on YouTube on internet, let's say. So I include these bits to help ordinary network researchers when they watch the videos, they should not feel lost. So what is TDA? Uh, TDA, usually uh, we use it to extract robust qualitative information and gain insight on data generating process when the data is high dimensional and noisy. And the standard toolkit for such inference is statistical and it provides computable noise tolerance answers to questions like what does the average data point look like? And what is the line or plane of best fit through the data? However, when you have a data generating process that is not nonlinear, then the utility of these conventional tools is diminished. TDA comes here, so I always ask this question, what is the true shape of this data? I would like to hear answers from network researchers because usually we don't see data like this. We have these nodes usually as vertices and we have edges between them, but here you see no edges between them and these are just data points. So TDA enables us to recover the geometric structure behind uh, data generating process when we have such data. In this case, for example, we can see these two, these shape with a hole in the middle and TDA will allow us to get this structure from data. Before I go to uh, TDA on networks, I have to say we have been working mostly on blockchain networks, which is, which is a very uh, hot research area these days. And in this, we can talk about, let me find this. Uh, we can divide blockchains uh, into cryptocurrencies and platforms. I will, I will talk about this to help you understand what type of networks we work on. So the difference between cryptocurrency and platform is important because they create different types of networks. And depending on the type of network, we use different TDA tools. Cryptocurrencies in general are the oldest blockchains. These are Bitcoin, Litecoin, Monero, Zcash. You, you have heard of Bitcoin, I hope. Then there are the platforms that started after 2015. Uh, platforms have also cryptocurrency on them, similar to Bitcoin. For example, Ethereum has ETH, but the distinguishing feature of a platform is not that it's a currency, is that it uses something called a smart contract, that's a small piece of code that is stored on the blockchain network. This smart contract is used to trade digital assets, and a digital asset can be anything from digital Pokemon to, to your house on the blockchain, for example. And this decentralized finance of trading these assets are becoming even bigger and bigger. And the, the volume of money in these things is huge with a lot of applications, a lot of fraud issues, a lot of research problems. So to summarize, cryptocurrencies have coins and platform blockchains have both coins and digital assets that are traded by using smart contracts. And if you look at the network, here I am showing you two different networks. On the left, we have the Bitcoin network. I'm showing a toy example where the circles are user addresses and the rectangles, the blue rectangles, are coin transactions. And the amounts that are shown on the edges are the Bitcoin amounts that are traded. So for example, A1 and A2 on the left most corner uh, are sending one Bitcoin each to transaction one, which collects these Bitcoins and then sends them to address five, A5. So the Bitcoin network looks like this. The network is heterogeneous because we have the transaction nodes in addition to address nodes. 
on the right side, I'm showing you the network of a digital asset that is called storage. This storage token network is taken from a single day and from the network you can already see that there are multiple edges between nodes. Uh, the edges are directed, Bitcoin edges are directed as well. But in general, in these asset networks, we don't, we cannot talk about the community structure, clustering coefficients are very low. So the community structure is almost non-existent. And this is from one day only. On other days, we have different set of traders, different set of addresses and edges between them. So the network completely changes. Okay. I hope this network figure is clear to you. Now, on these networks, we use two TDA tools. The first one is persistent homology, and the second one is TDA map. Uh, with persistent homology, we watch how the homology of a filtration of topological spaces changes so that we can understand something about the space. Remember the point cloud I showed you in the beginning? You can think of them as, the, as our vertices, and gradually we will add more edges and see how the data changes. How does it look like? So these persistent homology tools cannot really be applied to cryptocurrency networks because of two reasons. The first one is these networks are heterogeneous, so it is not easy to define distance between address nodes. The second one is the Bitcoin network, for example, contains around 800,000 addresses daily, so the network is huge, uh, and persistent homology does not scale well. On the other hand, TDA mappers scale well, and it is based on the idea of partial clustering of data guided by a set of functions, also defined on the data. But in TDA mapper, we needed to extract features from the network. In a sense, we have to create a new high dimensional point cloud from the network data and use TDA mapper on top of that. So TDA mapper can be applied to any type of network, heterogeneous, single node type, anything, but you need to extract features. And the best thing is that TDA mapper scale actually can go up to maybe 100,000 nodes. So once we have these methods and we have our blockchain network, we accept features and we use these features in machine learning algorithms to predict coin price, predict anomalies, classify network nodes. Uh, we have a bunch of works that are already published and several that are in the pipeline. In this talk, I'm going to uh, talk about three works. The first one is called uh, Dissecting Ethereum Blockchain Analytics, what we learned from topology and geometry of the Ethereum graph. Uh, this work was published in STM 2020, where we were also going to teach a blockchain struggle, but because of COVID issues, it was postponed. Uh, here, we are working on the Ethereum blockchain, which is a platform, which means uh, which means that addresses create transactions with each other and the network has a single node type. So, all the edges are transfers of tokens between Ethereum addresses. This is a trade network, daily network, and there are hundreds of tokens and their networks. So, you could basically have hundreds of tokens, each token has hundreds day history, so you could have thousands of networks. However, some of these tokens are also traded in real life. So they are listed on exchanges, for example, in this bottom figure, I am showing you etherscan.io, that's the blockchain explorer. And here you can see the price of three tokens. The first one is Tether, USD, the second one is Chainlink, and the third one is BNB. You will see their price, they are around $1, $14, and $24, and they are traded in real world, so their price changes. So we said this, does the token network contain enough signals and can we extract these signals to predict price anomalies? Just by looking at the network, can we predict the price anomaly in real life? And we use persistent homology. For the network researchers, uh, a very first problem when we work with uh, TDA on networks is that we need to define a distance matrix between data points. Here, our data points are basically uh, vertices. In this bottom figure, you will see data points and you will see four symbols, epsilon 1, beta 0, beta 1, and beta 2. Uh, epsilon 1 is a dissimilarity threshold where we increase from the left to the right, and as you increase more, you allow more edges to, to form between your vertices. 
And so here you will see that for epsilon 2, 0 0.28, we have these edges forming. Already some of these vertices are closing a simplex, and some of them are not closing. If they are closing, you show them with the yellow face. And if they are not closing, you see a loop forming here already. So the idea is to increase this dissimilarity threshold from zero to the maximum and see what kind of uh, topological features are appearing. So the, for example, we look at Betty numbers. Betty zero is the number of connected components. Betty one is the number of one dimensional holes. As you, as you move, then everything is connected somehow and some of these holes appear and disappear. For this, we first need to define the distance, and we define the distance by this formula, which says omega tilde is uh, infinite if there is no edge between them. So, if two addresses are not trading any token, we will not we will give them a very high distance. If they are trading some tokens, we will use this formula here. For omega uv, we will use the amount of traded tokens between these two networks to give this a distance. And we use A min and A maximum to scale this, uh, this distance from 1 to 10, I believe, yes, 1 to 10. So at the end, we will have each vertex as a data point, and the distance between uh, vertices are defined by using this formula. If there are no edges, it is infinite. So we don't allow the formation of simplexes if there are no edges between vertices. Next, we look at the network for different dissimilarity thresholds, and here we try to create a Vietoris Ribs complex, a simplicial complex whose p simplices consist of points which are epsilon apart. So we will start with epsilon equal to zero, and we will go to maximum, and we will see what is happening with the filtration of the uh, of the graph, and we will construct a chain of nested Vietoris Ribs complex. So for epsilon 1, for example, here, we will have one simplicial complex, then we will increase the dissimilarity threshold, more edges will be forming. So the simplicial complex will change, and we will have all this filtration. Then we are going to track the topological features that appear and disappear with this scale. And we are going to count these topological features. And if a topological feature has a longer lifespan, because remember, they can appear and then die, if they appear and don't die, they stay for a long time, then these can be called persistent features. And the name persistent homology comes from this. And these persistent features have a higher role in explaining, we hope that they will have a higher role in explaining structure and functionality of the Ethereum network. Remember, we will use these features to predict for price. So we hope that we will expect these uh, features and they will have some utility. And in this context, uh, we introduce a novel notion of petty functions. So we do a continuous filtration of simplicial complexes for epsilon value. Then we take the Betty function, we go up to Betty 2, so we compute Betty 0, Betty 1, and Betty 2. And then the sequence of Betty numbers then become finite dimensional realization. Right? Here I'm showing you three tokens. In each figure, you will see the Betty 1 function, and each line here comes from a network of a different day. So here, how many lines do we have? One, two, three. It is showing three days, Betty 1 functions for the same token, which is called Golem here. So already you can see that if you look at different token networks, you will see different Betty signatures. This is what we call them. Let me show you this one. So the Betty functions can be regarded as functional summary statistics of the network's topological structure. In this figure here on the right, I'm showing you four, uh, four lines, four functions, that come from the Tronix network on four different days, February 5, 6, 7, and 8. And when we look at the Betty 1 function, you will see that the day 8, February 8, has a very different looking Betty 1 function. Right? So when, once we start looking at Betty, uh, Betty 1 functions in this way, this allows us to utilize methods from functional data analysis. For example, we can take functional data that, and we can say, considering these two Betty functions for the same token from different days, can we give them a score that says this 
that the function of February 8 is very different from the rest. It turns out this is possible, and we use the functional data that supports it. But let me recap a little bit. So, we start from the network on the left. This is the biggest connected component. Then we use different similarity thresholds, and we look at how Betty zeros, Betty one, and Betty twos change. Here they are scaled from zero to one to compare to have the visual comparison, and the dissimilarity threshold is on the x-axis from zero to three. So as you can see, starting very soon, if you increase the weight, edges start to form. So uh, Betty zero starts to decrease. That means some of the vertices are getting connected, so the number of disconnected components of the graph is decreasing. This is network science explanation of this. Next, you will see that some batches early two-dimensional holes appear, but they also disappear. This is similar to our hopes in March that COVID-19 will be a short-term issue. So they appear and disappear, and then some of the holes, Betty 2 holes, start to appear again at scale 2. They don't persist, right? In this figure, for example, you can see, just by looking at this figure, you can see how, by changing the dissimilarity threshold, the network changes already. So the idea is the blue line here, here is Betty 0, the black line is Betty 1, and the red line is Betty 2. Can we use them? How can we use them? This is the main idea. And if we consider the Betty function associated with a token transaction network over days, we can take all these functions. Remember, they all come from Betty 1 here. We can compute a rolling band step on these functions, and we can identify the deepest or more central Betty function. Here they are shown, uh, it is shown with the red line in the center of the figure. So this is like the expected Betty 1 behavior of this token over days. If a token in a day is uh, diverging from this behavior, then we can assign an anomaly score to that day. And if you look at different tokens, they have different Betty signatures. On the left, I am showing the Tronix token. Uh, they are different. So for different scales, we expect different behavior in tokens. Now, coming to the experimental setting. We say that we have the network, we extract these Betty functions, and for each day, for each Betty function, we can define its depth by using functional data depth. And by looking at the rolling band depth, we can use it as a feature. We can say today's Betty 1 signature is not deep at all, and not deep at all in our context means there is an anomaly in the shape of the Betty 1 function of that token today. What we do is we take the network and we try to predict whether the price that is arbitrated in real life has no relation to the network at all will change more than a value in the next H day. And the accuracy should be at, low, at least wrong. We predict price anomalies in 31 token networks, and these are the features. For example, we define the price return of a token, and then we label a day as anomaly if there is a significant change in token's price. So we have the price information, but we need to label some days as anomalous or non-anomalous, and we use 10% price change as an anomalous day. If it is more than 10%, we say there was an anomaly. Either the price increased or decreased. It doesn't matter. We use one predictive model for each token, so we consider each token as a different, let's say, animal, and we build a prediction model for this, and we try to examine the performance for different prediction horizons. And the horizon in this uh, sense means how many days ahead you are predicting. Are you predicting the price change tomorrow or day after tomorrow? As a baseline uh, in financial studies, people take the price, the past price is a very good feature to predict future price of the token, and they take the edge number of edges, which means number of transactions in the network. If the number of transactions is high, then you could expect some anomaly. On top of the baseline model, we also add the Betty 0 depth, Betty 0 and Betty 1 depth, Betty 0, 1 and 2 depth. So we build these four models, and the price in this, in this bottom part, I'm showing you the rolling, rolling modified band depth and the number of edges in the daily token network and the price. When we look at the predictions made by these models, we will see that M3, M4, and M2, the Betty models, agree with each other on most of the predictions. 
And one, the baseline model makes a lot of predictions, 35 in this case here, that is not predicted, predicted by other Betty models. So as a general thing, Betty models seem to be conservative in making predictions, which is better for us. Okay. In this Venn diagram, the intersecting regions indicate that these models agree on predictions. So, for example, M3 here makes five predictions that are not predicted by any other model. These five predictions can come from any token, any day. So, these numbers are aggregate of all tokens. And when we look at accuracy, the accuracy is very high, actually. And compared to baseline model and others, the full model that uses P0, 1, and 2, has the least deteriorating performance when you try to predict further days ahead, so one to seven. So the accuracy results are actually nice that they offer evidence that Betty models are working, they are more conservative in making anomalous day predictions, and their accuracy is better than the baseline model. So that means two things. The first, the network had a signal, and the Betty models actually captured the signal to make some predictions. And here I'm showing the uh, sensitivity and specificity results. The main idea here is that when we use Betty 2 in our models, it decreases performance in true positive predictions. However, it, predi it helps in predicting true negative. That was an interesting thing. In other words, an increase in two dimensional holes in the network structure can be used as a predictor of anomaly. This work was, uh, was on blockchain platforms where the network was not. We have Can another a question. To... Junaid, quick question. Sure. So, um, do you have any intuition for what the two dimensional homology could mean in any, um, on an intuitive level, and, and why, would it, um, why would it detect anomalies? I mean, it's kind of hard to say, but if you have any intuition on that, it would be interesting to hear. Yes, uh, at, uh, towards the end, I have a slide where I talk a little bit about this. In these token networks, usually a small clique of people try to manipulate the price, or there are, let's say, investors that trade with each other. When these people trade, they only create edges with each other that result in a certain shape in the network that looks anomalous. And these, uh, these one-dimensional holes, like circles in network science, or these two-dimensional holes, can help us catch that behavior. Like these group of people, they are always trading with each other and not with anyone else. Very interesting. Thank you. Can I, can I so, ask another question? Sure. Um, so just to understand, so, so in, in the last part, you were describing some, some methods of, of predicting price changes um, in these uh, currencies. So, so is the idea that if you, I don't know, started with $100 and, and, and use this to, to predict whether you should bet for or against these, then, then after, you know, I don't know, a few days or a few months, you, you'd have $110? Or, or I'm, I'm misunderstanding this. Uh, you are correct. So we are trying to predict if the price is going to increase tomorrow more than 10%, right? But this is like a binary label. It will increase or not increase. In the next works, that I will show, we are actually trying to predict the price directly. So uh, we are trying to predict the Bitcoin price, should you put more money or not. In this work, we are just trying to see if TDA works with the network, and if the network has any useful information that will be reflected in the future price. Like, but, is but the is, network an early indicator? Is there some way of summarizing all the information by saying, hey, if we, if we followed this strategy, you know, after six months, we would have $200? Is there some way to summarize it? Uh, this one, this SCM work is more uh, related to cybersecurity that would say tomorrow this price is going to jump 10%. There is something going on with this token. So it's not, it can be easily changed to price prediction, of course, but we, we did something more difficult. We tried to predict anomalies. In Bitcoin, we have some, uh, we have work that is similar to what you want. Thanks. Thank you. So uh, actually, I said we have the next work that discusses this, but I will briefly just mention this and go to our uh, more recent work. So in the second work that is published in ICDM in Beijing last year, uh, 
uh, all of these works are uh, collaborations with Julia Gal and Murat Kantarjo from the uh, University of Texas at Dallas. I should have mentioned in the first slide, even I forgot, sorry about this. So in this one, we are trying to bring persistent homology to Bitcoin, which uh, proved to be a gargantuan task. Uh, because the Bitcoin network is so big, 800,000 uh, transaction addresses daily, and there are many transactions in them. So we, what we have had to do is we define a new network on top of Bitcoin network. So we took, let's say, 800,000 addresses, we defined a net, new network that consists of only 400 nodes, and that comes from the idea, the basic idea comes from our earlier work where we look at substructures in the Bitcoin network and try to create substructure nodes. With this one, we use Betty 0, Betty 1, and Betty 2, and we also looked at their uh, derivations to see how they are changing. And actually, our work, uh, as far as I know, is still the state of art, art in Bitcoin price prediction. It works uh, with a mean absolute precision error of 0 0.04, I believe. But I will not go into this one uh, very much. But the main idea is that on Bitcoin, we needed to do some tricks to convert the network to a new network. Otherwise, there was no way we could use persistent homology on Bitcoin. This is the main idea. So this third work <coughs> is about ransomware. Uh, the, the name of the paper is Bitcoin Heist with Yulia and Murat again. And we do topological data analysis for ransomware prediction on the Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, that is Ishkai 2020. Uh, however, that conference was also postponed to uh, 2021. The, the paper is online, however. So, ransomware is a growing concern. It's a type of malware that infects a victim's data and resources and demand ransom to release them. So in two main types, ransomware can lock access to your resources to encrypt their content, and it can also infect your mobile devices or IoT devices. Uh, a very scary example is uh, hackers getting access to your home through IoT devices and demanding ransom to let you in, for example. So once the resources are locked or encrypted, the ransomware displays a message that asks for a certain amount of bitcoins. They almost always ask for bitcoin payments. And this amount depends on the number and size of the encrypted resources because when the hacker sends this malware to the network, they don't even know who is going to be infected. So once the uh, malware infects a system, it sends a message to a command center that says, here is Junaid's computer, it has 100 gigabytes of data, and I encrypted all of it. So you should ask for ransom uh, for 100 gigabytes of data. After the payment, a decryption tool is delivered to the victim. And most ransomware use Bitcoin, and the current approaches for detecting ransomware payments on the Bitcoin, just by looking at the Bitcoin network, trying to identify which transactions are due to ransomware payments. People do uh, a couple of things. For example, researchers have been developing heuristics or information gathering steps. Uh, so what they do is they take a computer, they infect it knowingly, and they, they see which addresses it is demanding ransom to. And hacker addresses are in some cases known in the literature because companies report to the police that hackers are ransoming them. What we do is we take the Bitcoin network, the full daily network, we extract features from the Bitcoin network and use TDA network to associate Bitcoin addresses of today with hacker addresses from past. These past hacker addresses uh, come from three uh, resource papers, so they are clean addresses in the sense that we know they are uh, ransomware addresses. And we detect new hacker addresses for every ransomware family because there are more than hundreds now, we looked at 29 of them. The, the, the overall, the most interesting thing that came out of this TDA mapper work is that we could even detect the emergence of new ransomware families. So we could detect payments that are made for ransomware families that have not been seen before. Ransomware with no previous record of transaction. And uh, remember our Bitcoin network looks like this. So it has two types of nodes. 
circles are addresses and the rectangles are transactions and the amounts are indicated on the edges and the edges are direct. So we are going to extract features from this one to use CDA number. <clears throat> the first question is what features can be accepted? Second, for a ransomware family, do the hackers use the same transaction patterns on the Bitcoin blockchain? Do they use the same behavior? Third, do different hackers show the same behavior? Hackers of CryptoLocker, hackers of other ransomware, do they show the same behavior? And the fourth is, <clears throat> these four and five are the research problems that we answer. Can we detect payments that are disclosed, undisclosed? So some companies don't make noise when they are ransomed, they just go and pay the amount because they don't want other people to know that their security was lax. Can we detect these things? And the fifth question is even harder. Can we detect the emergence of new ransomware? The type that we have never seen before. So for this, we downloaded and parsed the Bitcoin transaction graph. In general, we always work with the raw data, so we parse everything ourselves. Uh, we parsed the Bitcoin graph from 2009 to 2018 December. Ransomware started in 2012. It is still going on, it's a huge concern. And we use a time interval of 24 hours, so we take snapshots of the Bitcoin network every 24 hours. And we extract the daily transactions of the network and form the Bitcoin graph. Then, in this data set, in this uh, ransomware data set, we have 25,000 addresses from 27 ransomware families. So we are trying to extract features for these known ransomware addresses and try to learn something from these features to predict or detect future ransomware addresses. This is the main idea. Here is uh, our features. So we extract six network features. Uh, the income is the number of Bitcoins an address received. That's a very good feature actually because early every ransomware was asking, let's say 0 0.5 Bitcoins or one Bitcoin. So if you look at 0 0.5 Bitcoin, there is a good chance that you will detect some of the ransomware payments. Then there is loop. Uh, loop, neighbor, wait count, these are extracted from the network to quantify a known obfuscation behavior. Because hackers, web smarter, this is an adversarial setting, so they don't use the same patterns, they start to use obfuscation methods, they create artificial transactions to send money to other addresses and then merge them, loop through addresses, stuff like this, these features are intended to encode this behavior. And they look like this. So here I'm showing you a table of these features. So length, as you can see, is always zero. There's a very good reason for this. Uh, because when people are ransomed, actually, they don't have the Bitcoins available. So they go to an online exchange and buy the Bitcoin and wait for some time and then make a payment. So if you look at the daily network, that ransomware payment is the first time that that address is, is used in the day. So this is why it's, it has length zero. So the weight is the amount of Bitcoin. It is 0 0.5 Bitcoin or one Bitcoin here. Then the number of neighbors, count, loop, income. Then we look at addresses here on the rightmost column, I'm showing the overall rank. One means most of the Bitcoin transactions use this pattern anyway. So if you extract features of all addresses, most of the addresses have the first pattern. So it's not very useful. However, if you look at the second feature, you will see that this pattern is the 113th most popular pattern in the Bitcoin network. So if you, if you catch these addresses with this pattern, there is a better chance that they are ransomware payments. Okay? So uh, I will not go into blockchain details of this. As I said, we teach blockchain tutorials in computer science conferences, but I will say that most of the payments are end to one or end to two payments. End to one means uh, the company collects some bitcoins from multiple addresses and makes a payment to one address. And in that case, the one address is the ransomware address. Okay? So if you look at the network just by looking at these patterns that we extract from past addresses, if we just do perfect pattern matching for these six features, you will see that you catch a lot of true positive features. So the problem is not that you catch a lot of true positives. The problem is that you catch too many false positives. So the idea is to reduce the number of false positives and TDA number is going to this. 
So if you use naive pattern search, we will catch 21,000 false positive batches, which is not ideal because a security analyst needs to sit in front of a screen and look at these suspicious addresses. And what they do is police usually go to online exchanges with the list of addresses and say, we believe these addresses are suspicious. Can you tell us who are the people behind these addresses? Give us the identities of them. So our job is to reduce this search space. Instead of 21,000, can we give the security analyst, let's say, 5,000 addresses? If we can reduce the search space, it will be very useful. However, the job is not so easy. Here I am showing you the stochastic neighbor embedding of ransomware addresses for six features. And here the dimensionality of six features is reduced to two features only, TSNE1 and TSNE2. And I'm showing you uh, the plot for different perplexities. In TSNE, perplexity means how many neighbors of one data point should you consider. So as you go further, it tries to uh, connect the data point to more neighbors. In this case, 30 is the highest complexity for example. What we see immediately is that there is some pattern. So the same colors are managed by the same ransomware hackers. So we see that there is some pattern in features. However, we cannot talk of a general global feature. So it seems like hackers uh, receive money and then they, for a few days, they use the same pattern. Then the next day, they start using a new pattern. So we cannot talk of a global pattern. On these features, we have the path label data. So the easiest thing we can do is naive cosine similarity search that I showed the results for. Then we can have heuristics that come from blockchain research. Uh, they are not about data. Then we could build three based methods. For example, we could do a random forest classifier with the path label data. We could cluster addresses of today with the address of past, and we, can, we could say if an address is clustered with past ransomware addresses, there is a high suspicion that address is itself a ransomware address. So we can use DB scan, k means all these things. Then the last step is using TDA mapper. And we use TDA mapper. <clears throat> Here in this plot, uh, that actually does not look like a very good TDA mapper plot, first of all, because TDA mapper plots are not supposed to be so to, co to contain so many disconnected nodes. Here, every node contains uh, a different number of rows, data points. So, for example, the biggest red cluster here, which is the vertex, contains 537 addresses. And the number next to it, 78, says that 78 ransomware addresses appear in this cluster. So, the yellow vertices contain no past ransomware address. So if you look at it, for example, if the size, if the number of uh, ransomware in that cluster is close to the total cluster size, you would say that there is more suspicion that the other members of the cluster are also ransomware address. This is the main idea. Here I am showing you partial clustering on just one feature. We have six features, so we do six times this work, and then we pick label the suspicious uh, vertices, suspicious data points, addresses, and we give them a suspicion score. And we look at how many times they appear in the clusters of known residents. It is like guilt by association. So if you look at this, uh, we build the TDA model, and then we build the suspicion score, and then we infer also the uh, parameters of the TDA mapper, which is a very tedious test. We do some predictions based on data. So we simulate our history. We start from a day and we train a model with data until that day. And we use the known ransomware from this day to see how good the model was. So we try to predict the known ransomware address. Here I'm showing you two graphs, precision and recall. The first thing you will see is the precision is very low. So it is 0 0.1, uh, it's of course, changes depending on the ransomware family. If the ransomware hackers are very smart, the accuracy will be very low, the precision will be very low. But the recall is high. So it seems like we catch most of the ransomware address. And the performance of TDA models, uh, here with sensitive models, we can make more predictions for every window. So the good thing about TDA in this work was that if there was not enough data, we could not find enough suspicion. 
and we could not label. So TDA helps us to avoid bad data. There are some bad days based on these days data. You cannot really make predictions. Uh, so we ignore these days. This is the main idea. And here are the results. In this table, I am showing you. Uh, Can I interrupt with a quick there. question? Sure. So we have a question from. Um, we have a question from uh, Song Ki Ung. What is a window in the prior uh, in, yes. this, in this slide? In this one? Yes. Uh, in this one, where is the window? I cannot see. So it's the word um, at the bottom of the slide. Oh, I see. Uh, a window means today. So we divided the Bitcoin network into 24 hour windows. That is what I call snapshotting the network. So for this day, we are trying to predict something. So uh, making predictions for every day that's instead of window. We try to predict the ransomware addresses of today. We try to predict ransomware addresses of tomorrow and go on. Was that clear? Um, I think it should be good. If uh, there's any follow-up questions, you can type it in the chat. So you can continue. Okay. Good. So the, it would be nice to actually use the full Bitcoin network. But in that case, uh, the network would be too big. The, the first <laughs> immediate uh, problem is that the network is too big to run. We do map on the full network. So we only use 24 hours at one time. The second thing is that if we use the whole network, we could not really train, right? By using this window approach, we can actually train with data until today and trade to predict the address of today. So this gives us this flexibility. So it allows us to see how well the model is performing. And in this slide, I'm actually showing that exactly. So in the table, you will see the ransomware name on the left, that is RS, for example, Loki, Crypto Wall, Crypto Locker. Then the best performing method, the two of them, in this slide, TDA always performs better than random follow, XGBoost, naive similarity search, clustering associations, everything. TDA never works better than all of them. And recalls are high, like for Loki, for example, we have 0 0.9 recall, but the precision is 0 0.16, which is low. However, uh, we have a continuation of this work. I did not include, I mean, in the same paper, we looked at the addresses that we find as suspicious, but turns out to be false positive. So we further analyzed them and we discovered the same address appearing in multiple windows with the same suspicion. So we very much believe that these addresses are also ransomware payments, but somehow they are not in the address list that we know because companies just made the payments without going to the police. So by our uh, predictions, up to five, six times more ransomware payments exist. So companies don't disclose, they just go and pay. So this was the first uh, detecting undisclosed payments result. The second result is, in my opinion, more interesting. Here we are trying to predict a new family. So let's say in the first row we have cryptics and we have never seen cryptics transactions before. If we use the data from other ransomware families up to today, can we predict? Cryptics. It turns out for cryptics, for example, that day we make two predictions and one of them is really cryptic and the other one is a false positive. This is also a suspicious address that we believe is, uh, is ransomware. So in general, as you can see, if you can give the security analyst two addresses and you say one of them, we, we tested it, one of them is a true positive ransomware address and the second one we believe is also. So you reduce the search space from 800,000 addresses to two addresses. And the security analyst can go and check the identity of that address. So the job becomes much more easier. This is the main utility of TDA mapper here. We predict 27 false positives for each true positive. In the previous slide, we were predicting 16 false positives. So we will give the security analyst 17 addresses and one of them will be true positive and 16 of them will be false positive. That means they are suspicious addresses, so you can go and check. The ransomware dataset is online at UCI. 
And it's a very nice data set because uh, time series data, it lists year and day. Uh, it has no blank data. It has six features. Uh, it has labels. Uh, you could use the labels as binary, ransomware, or non-ransomware, or you could use it as uh, six, seven ransomware. So you could label with the names also. It's a very nice data set, and uh, I hope you can use it. So coming back to the network science aspect of TDA, how can TDA help with networks in general? Uh, showing this slide again. So we use persistent homology and TDA mapper. Persistent homology does not scale well. However, right now we are also working on scaling this by changing a few things in persistent homology. But in general, let's say we will, I don't assume that we will reach 100,000 nodes anytime soon, okay? That's very difficult. The second TDA mapper can be applied to large networks. TDA mapper results are also nice, but they're hierarchical, so you could actually build a new model on top of TDA mapper. But TDA mapper requires extracting features. This is the main downside of it. So uh, we started using TDA on networks because traditional Network metrics did not help us. For example, on token networks, the network is so sparse, the nodes appear and disappear daily, it's multi edge So whenever we use traditional stuff like coefficient clusters, core scores, stuff like they didn't work. So we had to use TDA. And persistent homology can capture shapes that go beyond three nodes. This is similar to, I believe, Al Khanan asked this question of why two dimensional holes help us. Here I am showing you a one dimensional hole that appears when you have the network in this state. So this is, let's say, the simplicial context, and you have a one-dimensional hole among these vertices. On token networks, when you see a circle like this, there is a very good chance that these guys are manipulating the token price. So if you see a one-dimensional hole like this, it is very useful. You can say people are uh, manipulating the price today by creating artificial transactions in the network. The price is going to increase. Two-dimensional holes, three-dimensional holes. I cannot really explain three-dimensional holes or even two-dimensional holes, yeah? but I believe that it is capturing shapes in data that are local to some part of the network. So it allows you to isolate these shapes and count them. And the shapes of higher orders can also capture specific behaviors. We use Perseus uh, for persistent homology if you want to <clears throat> have your first steps here, and for TDA network, I have one more comment. So, in token networks, we had a lot of sparsity. In biological networks, I work on protein interaction networks, uh, gene networks as well. They don't suffer from sparsity. Biological networks suffer from overconnectedness. Every node is connected to every other node. So, in this case, persistent homology, well, it is not going to help you much. However, the good thing is that TDA mapper can be used on these networks, and if you have biological domain expertise, you can encode more features based on your expertise. For example, you can say that uh, a node feature can be the number of neighboring pathways that are ubiquitous related. If you, this TDA mapper feature extraction can actually allow you to bring the biological domain expertise into uh, network science. Then, we could use it. And for TDA mapper, I want to leave this pointer for network science people. In R, it is very easy to use. And this was all for my presentation. Thank you for listening. Um, so thank you so much, Junaid. Just before we ask any questions, please unmute yourself and um, applaud into your microphones. So we do have time for one or two questions. Are there any questions from the, uh, from the audience? I'd like to ask another question. Um, on, the, on the blockchain part of your talk, which was, which was very interesting. Um, so you, you mentioned one of the goals was to, to predict, um, you know, um, to, to, to predict these, these um, ransomware attacks. Um, 
if you're able to predict it, uh, then is there a way then to stop it? Or, or what, what, what do we gain? Or, or yeah, what do we gain if we can predict? Yes. So uh, by definition, if a transaction is on the Bitcoin network, it means it has already happened. So we cannot predict it happening, but we can detect uh, which transactions are payment transactions. And in, in prediction, I said we are predicting the emergence of a new ransomware. So the idea is this. Uh, many ransomware payments are undisclosed. So people make the payment. They don't tell the police and the police cannot catch these hackers because they don't know anything about the transaction, about the ransom, right? So the police are actively searching for ransomware payments. They want to know who are the hackers. So they first need to know which transactions are hacker transactions. This method here allows police to reduce the search space. When you start with Bitcoin, let's say you have 800,000 addresses, which one of them are controlled by hackers? The idea is to reduce this number to very few and then also identify certain transactions that look like ransomware transactions so the police can take this information and go to online exchanges, go to banks even. Now in the US you can open cryptocurrency bank account. The police can go to bank and say, I am looking for the owner of address, let's say five. Do you know anything about who is behind this address? Then the exchange can say, oh, it is, it is Junaid's address. <laughs> then you just go to jail, for example. So the idea is to help detect this. Got it. Okay. Um, thanks. Are there any other questions for our speaker? Uh, we have a question in the chat. Um, we have two um, questions. The first one is from uh, Ananta Krishna. Isn't it strange that someone would keep using the same addresses? Yes, they are not using the same address, but we still catch them. Um, and um, we have a question from, from Bay. How do you choose your mapper parameters? That's a very good question. Uh, that's very it's very difficult to choose mapper parameters. In this example, we back tested with known ransomware addresses to, to find which parameters were the best and then we use them. The TDA mapper parameter selection optimization, I believe is, uh, should be a thing. It's like uh, there should be more research into that. In this case, we use backtesting. Sorry, can you say that again? You use what? Sorry. TDA mapper, back, uh, we backtested in the sense that we took the data until today and we said, okay, if we use TDA mapper with these parameters, can we predict the ransomware of today? How good these parameters managed it? So from these, we selected the best parameters, and this is called backtesting in computer science. It's like you act like you don't know some part of your data, you use your that part of data to make predictions and then see how it goes. So you are optimize the parameters based on the prediction accuracy? Yes, exactly. Okay, thank you. Um, we have some more questions, but maybe we can um, take those off the recording. So 